Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different because last weekend I flew out of Toronto and went over to Montreal, Quebec for the Oceaga Music Festival for 2023. It ran over the long weekend here in Canada. I saw plenty of acts on the bill. It was kind of a little all over the place as most music festivals tend to be. And this is going to be something of an unscripted retrospective of my entire experience. Overall. I had a great time. It was the sort of thing I would easily do again. Music festivals often to me feel like a very much a natural environment, providing you're well prepared, you have your sunscreen, your bug spray, your earplugs so you don't ruin your hearing, and you mostly contain yourself responsibly. I mean, it's a music festival. All sorts of things can actually wind up happening. But overall, this is going to be running through as many acts as I was able to see. It's not everyone on the bill. It's not all the main stage biggest name acts, but hey, what you what can you do? When you're with a group of friends that you're trying to move with and they don't always move at the same space you do, you gotta do what you can do. And now a couple things to highlight here. I will have some footage that I'm juxtaposing in throughout the course of this, but I will say it's not of the highest quality. I didn't bring out all of my gear. And as such, you gotta make do with what you gotta do. And I try to get as many footage for acts as I want to ultimately see. Again, it's not gonna be the greatest footage. It's not always gonna be the cleanest, but you gotta make do. So let's start things off with set that I managed to catch was Magdalena Bay. I remember covering them back in 2021 and I got their appeal but it didn't really mesh with me as strongly or as emotionally as I would have liked. Maybe it's because I don't spend a ton of time on TikTok that might have been the reason but catching them live at a very early slot I was really impressed. I mean, the visual stylism is very distinctive for them. They've got a ton of energy. A lot of their backdrop, they put a lot of effort into actually presenting a very visually appealing set and their front woman is a delight on stage. She brought a ton of energy. It was such a good performance. I was honestly a little bit shocked that they were only one of the earliest sets to possibly catch. I gotta say it's probably because they might be branded as a TikTok act and a lot of those acts tend to get very early slots because they don't have that sort of mainstream larger backing. I kind of think that's a shame because Magdalena Bay probably has one more album that's a proper breakout. They will get on a later stage. They will absolutely deserve it. Lemon. They're an Australian indie blues rock, southern rock act with a very distinctive element on just chilling out and getting high and I gotta be honest, they're fine, but not something I'd really go back to. Overall, the sound was warm, generally appealing, fit very well in the background, but I didn't think the hooks were super strong. I chalk a lot of that up to their front man not being all that special, and I'd also say that the lyrics are kind of lightweight and the sound's derivative as hell. They had very much of a Spotify playlist vibe, as in you slot them in on a blues rock playlist. They would be very agreeable, they wouldn't disturb the vibe, but they wouldn't stand out that much either. Overall, the show was fine enough, I guess, I just wouldn't really go back to it.
Silverstone. I'll admit I'm a little bit surprised that she got billing that is this early, but also later than someone like Magdalena Bay. I got to assume it's because that she might be signed or have good connections already in place. Overall, I get why there's hype behind her. Even though she hasn't released a full-length debut album yet, which, again, a little bit surprised that she was on the main stage and got as much publicity as she did. But, again, I think there is some element of potential here. I think the songs are pretty well constructed. Kind of a blend between Haim and Phoebe Bridgers and a lot of the pop folk stylings. Got a bit of a rock side to it, too. It wasn't bad. Um, a lot of potential, I'd say. I wasn't blown away by anything that I was seeing. I'm a little bit surprised she got as big of a stage as she did, but it was fine. I would be interested in checking out that debut when it happens. We'll have to see. where things start to go a little awry and I have to stress that whenever I go to a music festival I try to find acts that I hear on record that I might not have loved but I'm like okay maybe they're better live and something will click for me that's how I got into La Dispute that's how I got into Post Malone if I'm being very brutally honest one of those acts I wanted to see was Soccer Mommy, who also had a big main stage and, and a lot of what she was doing at the festival. I was intrigued to see if that heavier, darker grunge sound would translate. And I'm sorry, uh, I was not impressed at all. I think there's a lot of issues that come out of it. I don't think Soccer Mommy's songs have great hooks. I'm still consistently on that boat. I don't think that she presented herself with a lot of charisma. She seemed a lot more interested to play and jam out with her band. And okay, that's fine. But it also wasn't really in the service of engaging with the audience. And as someone who was really trying to go there and trying to pick up on what was so special, I really didn't get it. I wasn't impressed. Maybe there was more there. Maybe it was just a bad show. Those happen, but yeah, bit of a letdown there. Got to be honest. Because recently the line is blurred Between depression and bliss And now I see that the times don't change They were soon But I just want to sleep through Now, this is one of those acts that's been on the periphery. I've heard about them a decent bit in terms of the indie scene. I've been aware of what they do. I've never really been super interested in checking out their albums. I've always found them very lightweight. And you know what? Going to see them now, it's very interesting, some of the commodification of indie rock, because this is a very pretty band. I get why they have a larger female fan base. Now, again, the songs are catchy. They're very polished. There's a lot of presence to the band. They certainly perform very well live. This is a very tight unit. I wasn't impressed by the writing. And again, it feels like they're very much targeted at a pop demographic. But again, they're fine. It's hard for me. I can recognize the mechanism working for what it's intended to do without getting angry at it. It's fine. Maybe not for me, but... They did it all right. They were a good time. They're probably worth seeing. I'd say that.
Okay, this is going to be a messy conversation because I think there's layers to talking about what happened with Rina Sawayama's set and why it did not work much at all. So here's the thing, and this is something I'm going to talk about a fair a decent bit, is that when you're framing a music festival, you want to be conscious of, as an artist, what's going to be in your set, how you're going to play to the audience, and maybe, depending on your venue, you might change up that set. You might bring in a different energy, you might bring in different songs, you might completely reconfigure your set list and presentation. That gets substantially harder when you are a much more theatrical performer and you have a specific mode and idea based off of themes on your album that you really want to drive forward. And festivals are not really built for that sort of theatricality unless you have the full weight and might of budget of being one of the big, big name headliners. Rina Samoyama was not that and honestly her set was uh, kind of a mess. I don't blame this all on her because, again, she's an incredible performer. Just the amount of charisma and presence and her vocal power is really there. But she had tech issues early. The mic kept on cutting out, which, again, was really bizarre because she was on the same stage as Magdalena Bay and they sounded amazing. So I don't know if there was gear issues. I also thought that she was situated for a lot of her dance moves further back on stage, so it didn't feel like she was engaging with the audience as starkly, especially given how theatrical her performance was. And then there was the set list. I gotta be honest, like, with this sort of set, when it comes to playing to a festival crowd, especially a mainstream pop festival crowd, a lot of the alt-metal stuff that she was doing was not going over. I wish it was. It was good for what we could hear of it when it wasn't getting punched out. Again, it was a kind of a messy audio experience as a whole. But uh, again, you kind of have to be ready to get the whole crowd on board. And she seemed distinctly annoyed by the fact that the crowd wasn't giving her as much energy. And yeah, the tech issues are certainly a factor there, but the set list wasn't helping her. I also think that the, the whole set list had a tough time with momentum because she had outfit changes, she had specific dance choreography that she was trying to incorporate. That's very tough to do, especially in a late afternoon set when you can't take a, the whole experience of a nighttime atmosphere, which I think this particular set list would have done more with. I also don't think all the presentation was super strong either. I think it was a big mistake to hide her band for so much of the set and then they pulled down the tarps and then they were there and I'm like, why not just bring more of them to the forefront? Have a slightly more crowded stage. It would present a little stronger. Now, I will say it got better as it went on, and Rina Samoyama is such a good performer that I'd love to see her in a venue that wouldn't have all these issues, but... It was probably one of the bigger disappointments that came out of the festival. I gotta be honest there. Uh, again, it was a real frustration. It's not all her fault, but it's not not part of her fault. feelings on the flaming lips doing all of yoshimi battles the pink robots one of their albums that came out late 90s very early 2000s around the turn of the millennium now i love that album and 
it was really, you could tell the Flaming Lips, they always put on a very stark, very powerful show. They are a theatrical band. They have been for decades now. And it was always going to be a experience when it comes with this brand of psychedelic rock. Now, Wayne Coyne is not the singer he used to be. His falsetto was definitely rough at some spots but he is the sort of performer who can command a stage especially with all the theatrics around him i gotta give them a lot of props for that where i think things may have gone off the rails here is that yashimi battles the pink robots is an album from like over 20 years ago it's a phenomenal album i really liked it i really appreciated it but if you were expecting that same sort of energy from a crowd who probably don't remember the full arc of that album, especially as it probably came out before some of them was, were even born, it's going to be a tough experience. The other thing is that it's psychedelic rock, and it's an older psychedelic rock album that really relies on cultivating a very strong vibe, and even with Legal Pot up here, where you could tell a lot of people were sparking up throughout the course of the show, it... I could tell that it probably wasn't clicking as powerfully as it could. Now, the Flaming Lips are consummate professionals. They were going to put on a great show. I did have a good time with it. I feel like it could have hit a little better in a different venue or maybe with a different crowd. That's all. highlights for me was jpeg mafia i have been preparing for a jpeg mafia set for a while because i've been reviewing him since i want to say 2019 and i had a blast watching this i was able to get close enough that i was able to get really good footage or good enough footage for a later night set really happy with how he turned out especially as it was just him and his laptop and the fact that he was able to bring so much energy so much presence while still running back to his laptop every time to switch up the songs and flip out into the right register turn on his auto tune off and on and it was impressive how much power he has it will never not be weird to hear mike c town's name in a rap song that goes off on a festival stage but that certainly happened also he did an entire version of carly ray jepson's call me maybe I just met you, and this is crazy, but here's my number, so call me baby, it's hard to look right at you baby, so here's my number, so call me baby, it's hard to look right at you baby, so here's my number, so call me Vice 
devices. Yeah, but wouldn't know what good advice was. Uh, said I'm leaving lifeless. Another mama crying, it's another crisis. Lord knows we just trying to live right, Jesus. So you willing just to make the sacrifices? I know we can't continue living like this. And I never saw my sister. my saga with the handy yaku. Me and my niggas trying to eat you pussies in banana. Flow like penny lava, but just a penny I can multiply my wealth and make you work for me for penny hours. Swear these niggas know they copy me for listening. Could they been the same since Biggie spec me at my christening? Watch what you just shit in. Please put your dick in your position on the top and switch it right in front of your face. Rockin' by the space with rhymes up on sit down. Keep ducking down, got some missiles now, headed for your house. Put the pistols down, got that red dot in your nose. We put the cut a lot, draws like a blue nose hole. Keep your mouth closed or you can see the soul. I got connections here, got my tits to see. You in that underground so no. The way y'all flows, then switch them. Foes been on a mission, listen, into the chamber, get hyperbolic. Raising max up, raise stakes to keep them frolic. Riches is macrocosmic, past the chronic, the man's a sonic. Since like years before. You're novice, but I got no that strike nerves. Promise your minds ain't sharp like my swerves. Cut the BS and don't worry when my G's is. And P's, your bitch is genius. Look for my penis. Got trees selling arenas and breaking brackets. Sit this racket while I'm cracking a Serena. Goddamn, God bless the heaven that sent you. But I'm freezing out. I was a little bit surprised about Joey Badass getting a late set did not surprise me. Until it kind of did, because Joey Badass's album from last year, I really liked it. It did well, but it wasn't the sort of thing that I've seen a ton of buzz about or seen a lot of conversation. Also seemed targeted at a bit of an older demographic, especially with its sound and a lot of the content. So I was curious how well it was going to go over. And then I saw Joey Badass live and I'm like, no, wait, this guy's a superstar. I get exactly why the set was so late in the day. He really did a phenomenal job with the songs that we got. It was a tremendously great, smooth hip hop vibe. Played stuff for girls while also getting the mosh pits open. I was really impressed by how well he could command the stage. It drives me nuts that he has not had a proper mainstream crossover because this guy's a superstar, but he's predominantly chosen to stay independent, run all his stuff with Pro Era. I get why. He's probably made incredible bank off of it. I think he probably deserves a bigger stage because this was excellent. And a lot of the songs that I... And hell, he played Temptation, which was my favorite song of his period. He took it back across all of his eras. I cannot complain. Excellent set. Genuinely impressed. Too. And the first act I was really excited to see was Red Veil. Now, again, Learn to Swim was one of my favorite albums of 2022. The EP he dropped this year, I specifically commented that it was built for a festival environment. And yeah, absolutely true. Um, Red Veil brought so much goddamn energy to the actual presentation and performance. I was so happy just how well the crowd was accept was accepting of it, especially for an early afternoon set. Like that was the sort of thing where you could put Red Veil on later in the day. I would argue he did better than some of the other rappers who might have a bigger name or a bigger following or have more Spotify listeners, but. Again, Red Veil had so much energy, so much presence, and the songs work so well. This kid is destined for bigger things. I love the fact that he brought JPEG Mafia out for his, for a verse there. And again, I had so much fun with it. The kid's a superstar. I, if you have a chance to go see him, please take the opportunity. Also check out that EP from this year. It got slept on by a lot of people, and it didn't deserve to be. Great stuff.
they are not in many of this footage, probably for good reason. And this is where they were also, the posting in my schedule of getting to see acts was a little bit more erratic. In this particular case, we went to go see Casablanca. I will be a little bit honest, it's more on the tech house vibe. Very synth heavy, the drops were very bass heavy, very impressive in that regards. I wouldn't call them super distinctive. Again, this is not really my genre. I fully understand that. And we couldn't get super close to really appreciate the whole pulse pounding rave vibe, especially as again, it was kind of late afternoon, sun hadn't set yet. It hadn't really cultivated all that atmosphere, but it was still fine. I'm not complaining about it. There was certainly, I've certainly seen worse electronic acts and this was good. I enjoyed it. Fletcher. I've covered Fletcher briefly in Billboard Breakdown. I've been waiting for her to have her proper breakout. I'll admit I was surprised to see as much of a crowd show up for her as she did. And you know what? Credit to her, she is a pop act that I think has a lot of traditional presence. She could play to being a pop star if in today's industry we were accepting of traditional pop stars. And that, I think, is kind of the problem. I've never been impressed by the songs that she's had. I mean, I recognize them. They play for a certain amount of melodrama. It makes sense why she would be doing well. But there's very few that's, that jump off the page at me. She operates at a pretty solid C plus to B minus range. Honestly, in a lot of the same territory as Ava Max, where you can tell that the effort is there, the presentation and, the t and her overall demeanor towards the crowd was there. She's a good performer, but maybe the music itself isn't quite at that level to really put her over the top in a dual leap of port away. I will say this, she did a couple of covers that... I think that they were of Katy Perry and Britney Spears, and they were good covers, but they were getting pops bigger than her actual songs. That's kind of a problem. Gotta say it. curious about this one but I was also kind of dreading it because Lil Yachty with Let's Start Here I was really curious how it would translate live because that brand of psych rock I mean it's proven to work look at Tame Impala look at the Flaming Lips but you need to be able to cultivate the atmosphere and I, I hate to say it I don't think Lil Yachty pulled it off at least for the first half of his performance I think Let's Start Here is one of those albums that's getting a lot of acclaim on Rate Your Music or among music critics for its swerve, but maybe not for the crowd that knows him for the bangers, that knows him for his verse on Broccoli, who knows him for those moments that get a little bit weirder like Poland. And that kind of makes things difficult when he wants to set up this grand psychedelic rock vibe and the crowd's like, what the hell is this? It doesn't really help that while his band is excellent, Lil Yachty just did not have a lot of energy throughout the whole presentation. He said he was coming down when he was sick with something. I believe it. He also felt very slow on stage. He didn't really know how to command the audience when it came to the psych rock stuff. And you know what? Fair enough. That is hard to do on a festival stage. The Flaming Lips struggled with it. But it didn't help him. And I feel like... When he switched over to doing the more festival-ready bangers, I get why they went off better. It kind of sucks because, again, I liked the psych rock stuff. It was interesting. It was certainly 
reasonably well performed when Lil Yachty could perform well. His vocals were not all the way there. But again, I think this was a situation where he was trying to do something. It wasn't fully translating. I get why he made so much trap music now. It works for the audience that wants it. I'm kicking myself that I didn't get into Sophie Tucker earlier on because that sort of pop dance sound was something that I just think I missed. It was coming out around 2019, 2020. It was a sort of era stuff that I feel like I really could have gotten into. And I was close to really getting into it because it was really colorful, really well put together stage show. A lot of the beats and grooves were excellent. The hooks were certainly there. They actually stuck with me. I didn't get a lot of good footage because I couldn't really get close to it. Um, kind of a shame because a lot of the guitar work was really striking. A lot of the, the dynamics and chemistry between the two performers was really, really cool. I, I get why they've crossed over with a festival audience. They seem kind of built for that. Also, maybe if they hadn't, like if I missed something on record, I think it was, this was one of the acts I wanted to go back and check because I felt like I was missing something. The crowd certainly was really into it, had a lot of fun with that. I had a lot of fun with the experience of them. It was the sort of act I want to hear more. I'm kicking myself that I didn't get to them sooner. I will say that. seen the national before they were actually a headliner last year when i saw them at pitchfork music festival honestly i should have done a video about that music festival different time and place anyway the national are phenomenal live um they played tropic morning news as their opener and as i was in the middle of crying the water cannon hit me straight in the face as you do um, the one thing I will say about The National is they play to a slightly older audience. They're one of those indie rock acts that's been around for 20 years. I'm a little bit surprised how many people were really, really into them, especially as they play a much more stately, reserved brand of indie rock. I guess that Taylor Swift crossover gave them enough visibility to a more mainstream audience, but... They went off. They had. I really enjoyed the show. It was perhaps a little muted compared to the reception I saw for certain other acts. But hey, Matt Beringer did a phenomenal job. I really enjoyed the whole experience. Uh, if you have a chance to see The National, go do it. That last album was underrated as hell. I still think it's fantastic. Check them out. <laughs> festivals and especially about Oceaga is that the two biggest stages are probably about a 10 minute walk over a lot of flights of stairs to get to the other two main stages which is where Carly Rae Jepsen was performing so I couldn't quite I missed about half the national show and I tried to race over to get the rest of Carly Rae Jepsen's show it was a hike to get over there. I missed most of Runaway With Me, which I was a little disappointed by. But this was also the show where I was a little concerned, given that I didn't love The Loveliest Time. 
And then I saw Carly Rae Jepsen put on a consummate show as a professional, and you get why she's become a festival staple, especially in Canada. She's got tremendous stage presence, the song catalog is pretty robust now, and she can really capture a lot of different moods within pop and synth pop. The crowd was super into it. It was a really magnetic vibe, really, really enjoyable. She's definitely a B-card act at this point in her career, but she's very comfortable in this lane, and she pulls it off damn near flawlessly. I really enjoyed the performances. Please, if you get a chance, check out more Carly Rae Jepsen. I like hearing more of her music. Even if I'm cooler on that last album, she's still great. back in 2019 back at a Reading Film Reading Music Festival in the UK. I really really enjoyed what Billie Eilish put together. I'm like, wow, for a late afternoon set without much control of your atmosphere, she just commanded the audience with very low key tracks cuz this was all coming off of that deb the debut album when we all fall asleep where do we go? This gives her a bigger catalog, gave her a pretty big stage for just one person to bounce around and have so much energy as she does. Uh, she's phenomenal live. Billie Eilish, everything you've heard about her as a superstar, even with the fact that she doesn't have a band, she didn't have dancers, she was doing a lot of it on her own, she killed it. It helps that the songs are great. It helps that she's a great singer. It helps that she commanded the atmosphere so well. And it helps that her stage presentation and performance was so tailor-made for it. I gotta be say, I'm really happy that that is translated to the biggest stages possible. She was one of the headliners. And it was worth it. Billie Eilish is absolutely that sort of pop star. I hope she sticks around for a long time. Because she's excellent. Jonathan Waugh. Um, he is the son of Patrick Waugh, uh, the NHL goalie. I gotta say, I, he's a bit of a presence in Canadian music, a little less so on my side. I don't really follow a lot of his stuff. He plays a brand of kind of blue-eyed soul, a little bit more on the a little bit more on the rocker side. He clearly wants to be seen as some sort of rock star. He's got that swagger and presence and actually a pretty good voice. But the songs aren't there. Uh, it's the sort of thing where I it can come across a little edgeless in my opinion. It was very much built for an early afternoon set. I wasn't really going to complain about that. I didn't mind his material. He's got presence. He's a good singer, but I didn't think the songs really connected. The writing is kind of weak, but it's it's not bad. I'm certainly not going to complain. Love, Sammy. 
ones where I'm a little frustrated. Milk and Bone are this Canadian indie pop duo, and they've got very much of a bit of a trip hop R&B touches to their sound, a little bit of Aurora there as well. I wish their presentation worked for me at all. I mean, the vocal harmonies were really good, but it was one of those cases where you could tell they were singing more to each other than playing to the audience. I didn't think the songs were super striking either. The grooves were pretty good, and again, they put together really nice harmonies, but the songs weren't sticking for me. Maybe some of it would be because, because some of the songs were dabbling in French, and I'll admit that kind of works for a Quebec audience. you got to be able to play to both sides of the language barrier there. But at the same time, I wanted to like it more than I did. Uh, maybe they couldn't have as much atmosphere as they as they wanted because, again, early afternoon set. But mm, it just wasn't fully there. Didn't quite mesh for me. very mean with an act like Hollow Coves where when I was started listening to them at the festival for the first time I found them incredibly bland and edgeless and honestly kind of uninteresting. A lot of pleasant grooves and vibes but not really a hook or a lyrical moment that stuck out. Actually I thought the lyrics were really really basic. But at the same time, I get what purpose this band will serve. They're a pretty good act that you put on at like 3.30, 4 o'clock if you just want to vibe out or you've already gotten drunk already and you just want to veg for a little bit or just get real stoned. I, at the same time, they're not a band I would return to. They're definitely a very pretty band. I get the, why they put them alongside and act like Wallows. It makes sense why they have a fan base. But I wasn't super impressed. You can take or leave them. for a lot of the same reasons I wanted to see Soccer Mommy because I like Bia Badoobie's albums but I've never been wowed by them. Uh, again, it's pretty good pop rock, definitely a throwback sound but they haven't clicked as strongly. I wanted to try to get what the hype was and you know what? Seeing her live, I get it. Bia Badoobie has so much infectious energy and presence. She's got great chemistry with her band. There's a lot of loose vigor to how she performs that in this sort of pop rock you kind of need. And she was really thrilling for what she put together for the, the couple songs I managed to catch from her. I was really impressed by how well she came out and delivered with, honestly, songs I didn't love. Overall, great little set from her. I was impressed by it. She actually probably won me over. Good stuff. I'd make time to go see her. So pretty, pretty like the wind. Every time you touch me, I feel a trembling. It's Black Friday, end of the week. Take my hand and hold it gently up against your cheek. It's all in my head, it's all in my mind. I see the darkness where 
side okay if we're looking at the experience of the festival i probably had the most negative response to that might be contradictory tom odell i do not get the hype behind this guy actually let me rephrase that i get the hype this guy is one of those english melodramatic singer songwriters who's not interesting enough to be hosier and is not self-deprecating enough to be lewis capaldi and has nowhere near the groove of someone like ed sheeran Ultimately, what I get from Tom O'Dell is he, he there's a sort of there's a piano rock sound and vibe to him, kind of in the same realm as James Bay, but with worse writing and a lot of extremely downbeat notes, which is weird because his performance doesn't really sell that. He's trying to bring a lot of drama to the table, capital D drama. But the problem with a lot of his stage presence is that he's got this, he's trying to be this debonair charmer. There's a bit of Elton, actually, there's a bit of a Billy Joel side to him, where it comes across as kind of mercenary. It comes across that I'm so good at what I do that you guys just have to take this in as I rend my heart in front of you. But his writing's not interesting, and while the piano work is good, the arrangements were not compelling or unique, and the production was not special, this is one of those guys where apparently his biggest hits were some of his best work, but I heard some of his newer stuff that he was trying to roll out at this festival, and I did not care for it whatsoever. This guy... It, that, leave him on the other side of the Atlantic. We don't need him out here in Canada because, woof, I did not enjoy this at all. the old Mike the Snare reviews of the two Foles albums. I want to say they're coming out in either 2019 or 2020. I want to say 2019. I think I'm wrong. Anyway, so when it comes with Foles, they're an act I've kind of had at arm's length. They're the act that you're always like, oh, they're an indie rock band. They're kind of in the B-list tier. Uh, I wouldn't turn them off if they come on. And then I saw them live, got pretty close to stage, and I'm like, wow, were they always this good like this is one of those bands they were tight they were lean they had great grooves the presentation was really dynamic there was a lot of chemistry with the band the hooks were there and they're one of those bands i'm like oh shoot i might have overlooked them i wanted to give them more attention then you get midway through the set and you realize oh wait they certainly have their sound and i get kind of why they don't stick to the same degree Foles has a bit of a reputation for bombast, but without a ton to really support it. I don't think their hooks are completely top tier. I don't think their writing's top tier either. They have a lot of bombast, a lot of flair, and it's certainly enjoyable, but it kind of leaves your head surprisingly quickly. It's good music. It's good indie rock. I'm happy that I caught them, and they are a great presence live. It's just, I kind of wish they stuck with me a little more. That's all. that I wish stuck a little bit more deeply for me, uh, Fred again. Now, this was one of the acts that a lot of my friends were really psyched to see. I was a little less so. I've never 
fully gotten on board with Fred again. I get what he does. I get the ideas behind it. But And I really wanted to see him in a more communal dance environment. Because, again, the crowd adored this guy. And I, I'll give Fred again this. He certainly works himself out, up a real sweat as an electronic producer. He's really working the, the, the control pads. He's really been able to set up a theatrical stadium-sized, festival-ready performance. I just wish I liked the music a little more. Like, the hooks are there, but the percussion always feels a little thin. I don't always feel it sequences itself super well. He also does a lot of stuff where he's chopping the songs up midway through, and I don't always think that they translate those fragments effectively. There are powerful moments. I get Fred Again's appeal. It just didn't hit as strongly as I know it hit for everyone else. I'll give him that. I, he's talented. I understand why in a festival environment he absolutely made sense to get as late billing as he did. Made sense. The crowd adored it. I just didn't fully get there for me. That's all. Now, full disclosure, I've seen Kendrick twice before, once in 2017 on the Damn Tour, once in 2018 where it was at a music festival at the very end of the Damn Tour. The one thing I will say is that this is probably my favorite Kendrick Lamar set that I got from him. Mostly because he played pretty much every song I liked except The Black or the Berry, which I don't think he will ever play live anymore because, again, that song is very politically charged. At the same time, though, Kendrick has such presence on stage and he's got so much command of the audience that sometimes it can almost feel like you're getting two-thirds of a set because the other third is the crowd right in front of him screaming back all of his lyrics to him. And when it comes to his biggest songs, that really happens. That's one reason I appreciated when he went off the beaten path and he played stuff that was like slightly deeper cuts that came off of Damn or came off of Mr. Morale or from Good Kid Mad City. Hearing like Mad City and uh, Backseat Freestyle or the verse that he did on Pusha T's Nostalgia, like those are really translated well. I was having a blast with those songs. I will say that it kind of lost a little steam near the end. It kind of blew its load really early because again, Kendrick has a repertoire of hits that can go off pretty fast. But at the same time, I'm not complaining. Kendrick Lamar is such a great performer, and it's really enjoyable to hear, especially as it felt like there was more of a proper full band behind him, and he wasn't totally getting subsumed by the theatricality, as that kind of happened on the damn tour a little bit. Overall, I really enjoyed it. If you have an opportunity to say, see Kendrick, just do it. He's so good, it's worth your time. Ega 
experience. I kind of went a little long for this, actually longer than I expected, but hey, there's a lot to say. There was a lot to see. A couple other periphery observations that come out of this. Did not love the food as much as I wanted to. I didn't feel like the variety was completely there. You kind of run into that at the larger mainstream festivals. I will say, though, you're getting poutine in Quebec. Like, that is the one reason to get there. And poutine is a great festival food because it has a lot of calories. It'll keep you going for a while. Also sits in your stomach and soaks up any alcohol. Where are we on the topic of drinks? I gotta be honest, the the liquor, what there was available, it was all overpriced because festival, duh. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that the craft beer selection was super great outside of one specific vendor. That's kind of the thing where I think Pitchfork had a slight edge there because they had more vendors that actually had better like underground craft beer, and that's more to my taste. But also, I will say that Oshiega, if there's one thing I will recommend for there, get VIP. My God. The bathroom situation, if you were not, if you were around that area, it it picks up a smell like all festivals do the vip bathrooms where they're just off to the side a little bit more private you get out of the line faster also were a lot cleaner highly recommended on that business alone also the higher viewing decks that came with a lot of the vip space was also helpful if you just wanted to get away from people and some a lot of festivals can be very overwhelming in that regard just so many people in one place at one time you want to have a place just to breathe and catch your breath VIP did help in that regard. I also say that I didn't run into any issues with security. I ran, I thought the medical staff was very much on par and on train when they were able to catch people who may have OD'd or gotten caught up in crowd incidents. There was a crowd incident that happened near Kendrick and Kendrick stopped the show to help the person get out and get free. That was really good on his part. I was actually really impressed to see that. A couple of the other acts did, it too, did that sort of thing too and that's important that people are taking that sort of crowd safety very seriously, especially at festivals. Flight situation was fine. It's in and out of Toronto. They're out of Toronto Island. Very easy to get to Montreal from there. It's a pretty short flight too. It's like an hour and a half at most. Um, had a baggage issue on the way there, but ultimately still got my bag. Got to the hotel just in time. I had a really good time at Oshiega. I'd be happy to come back, do more press stuff in the future. For other stuff in terms of the Spectrum Pulse side of things, I did get recognized. I want to say three or four times. That's always a hoot to see. I, I was also wearing t-shirts that were very much provocative and in my lane. I think on day two, I had my Dirt Emo shirt, my Rustin Kelly shirt. Day three was my Bad Seed shirt, and that tends to get immediate recognition right out of the bat, which I was happy to see. Also happy to meet fans. Glad that some of you guys were able to stick around. That was pretty cool. Outside of that, Oshiega was a really good festival. I'm not sure I would put it at top tier in terms of my festival experiences. I'd say 20, either 2018 or 2019 is probably up there when I went to Reading Festival. And again, some of the acts there were just, it was a stacked as hell lineup in some of those years. But overall, for this sort of music festival, I wish that we had an option similar to this in Toronto. I think the scene got oversaturated here in the mid-2010s and never has fully recovered, but... Hey, it happens, and Oshiega is still available, still puts on a one hell of a show. And hey, we'll see what happens next year. You'll have, we'll have to wait and see. But beyond that, thanks you all so much for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, comment if you were there, what were your favorite acts on the bill, that'd be great to hear. And again, if you in some of the situations where I do have slightly more contentious opinions about the acts, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts, especially if you were at Oshiega and took in the performances yourselves. Beyond that, though, if you guys want to get albums on my schedule for any future reviews, link to my Patreon is right over there. And as always, don't feel obligated, tough times, but the option's available. Until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.